This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1143, recorded on August 16th, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and hello, everybody else. Uh, it's quite a nice day out. It's a little hazy. I don't know where that comes from. The haze is all over the place, but the temperature is reasonable and the humidity is reasonable. So I think I would take 100 days like this. Why 100? Where does that come from? I um, mean, that's the most you can expect from Mother Nature. I think the rest of it is up to her. I see. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Howdy, y'all. <laughs> uh, it's uh, 98 degrees and sunny. It's not 100. I think I've said that before. From Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 75 Fahrenheit, which is 25 Celsius. It's a beautiful day. Sunny. Couldn't ask for anything more. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's 84 Fahrenheit, 29C, moderate humidity, gorgeous day here. We are also getting a little bit of haze. And that, by the way, Dixon, is coming from Canada, from wow. wildfire, well, wildfires. wildfires. How about We've got, mountains? again, this year, like we had last year, we've oh, got wildfires brother. going on oh, in Canada brother. and huge amounts of smoke. Oh, it's boy. McFadden's fault. through. I blame I blame McFadden for all of this kind of stuff. The cold it's, weather, um, the smoke. It's a connected know. world, right? Blame Canada. Yep. If you enjoy these science programs of Microbe TV, we'd love to have your support. Microbe TV is a nonprofit entity, and we depend on your donations to do our work. In fact, your donations would be federal U.S. tax deductible. So go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have several ways you can... Help us out. What is it that you're helping with? Explaining good science, telling factual science, right? All the right things, not misinformation. Okay, a little bit of news today. Uh, as we just recorded a TWIF on Monday, we talked about MPOX. WHO has declared a public health emergency of international concern. At the time, they were thinking of doing a continental. <laughs> Concern, but now they decided because there's a case in Sweden, traveler from Africa who brought back uh, MPOX. Now it's international concern. So we have a an article from the Director General declares MPOX outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. The upsurge of MPOX in DRC and other countries constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. P H E I C. It's unfortunate, as we said on Monday, probably this should have been dealt with previously because this has been going on for a while, decade. There have been cases in the DRC for over a decade. And um, 15,600 cases, 537 deaths. And this is clade 1B, spreading through mainly through sexual networks. And, you know, what's the what are you going to do? You, we have antivirals and we have vaccines. and so they need to be deployed. Should have been deployed, deployed previously. You know, if you have a t thousands of cases of a disease, mostly in one country, you should do something about it. Well, yeah, somebody should do something about it. But doing something about anything in DRC is um, yeah not true. I was going to say, I, I think that it's, one of the one of the big things here is just social instability. Yeah, and uh, instability in the. Uh, in the healthcare system, and that's actually going to come up in one of the other news articles. I would say that uh, the other thing that I'm finally sorting out, by the way, <clears throat> the uh, Wikipedia uh, entries on monkeypox and mpox are quite good. So, uh, and uh, this is something I actually know a thing or two about, so I can I can <laughs> verify that they're that, that they're actually credible. Um, uh, the there, there's 
in this discussion, there's talk about the fact that this is a variant of clade one mm. called clade one B. Um, I would say that I have not, not I'm now I'm not way into the weeds on this, but nothing I've read says anything about this clade one B being more transmissible or more lethal or anything like that. Okay. Uh, uh, I think one of the fears here is that it does seem to be spreading and clade one is the clade that has the higher mortality rate. Okay. Uh, previously it was clade two that spilled out, uh, into the globe that had a lower mortality rate. So now if we have spread of clade one and that has a higher mortality rate, uh, then that I think gives people some concern. And it's not like we should just, you know, shrug about the fact that it's a variant there. That may be of consequence, but I haven't seen, uh, any, any evidence yet. Um, I would also say that uh, historically, clade one has been described, or clade two has been described as having like a 1% mortality rate, and clade one has been described as having a 10% mortality rate, but that's based on a small number of cases in Africa. Uh, and uh, once clade two got out worldwide, the uh, case fatality rate uh, of that was uh, significantly less than 1%. I forget exactly what it was. But it was a lot less than uh, what the historical thinking was. So it could be that clade one, as it spreads and gets into other uh, regions, and particular regions where the sort of healthcare and public health is, is better, mm. um, that it will prove to be less than 10%. But that's just speculation on my part. The other public health emergency of international concern is polio. There are two at the moment. Uh, this is an article on Tecavir, Matt. Someone want to talk about that? Right. So I was just about to say that Rich was kind of leading into uh, what we know, uh, you know, based on various things with respect to these drugs and uh, things. It's, it seems like we're learning from this link that we put in that's uh, something kind of like a press release from the NIH. Uh, it's not really the scientific data and it's, I mean, it is a little bit, but with, I mean, it's the description of what the results are, but there's no data. And there's a lot of thanks to all the various participating groups. But the, the take-home message is that they've looked at clade one in the DRC, and they gave people this Tecoviramat, which is what, 246 ST246. Yes. That's the original name. Right. I think uh, for for our current peri uh, uh, purposes, uh, Tecoviramat, that's the official name. That's what we ought to do. But right. for anybody out there who's deep into the history, this is ST246. And also goes by the name of T-Pox. T-Pox, yes. Right. Same thing. And how does this, uh, what's the mechanism for Tecoviramat? It inhibits a, okay. Uh, uh, pox viruses have two enveloped forms. One is formed intracellularly, uh, and it is the really tough nut to crack. So when, when you, uh, <clears throat> uh, it, uh, you can you can uh, freeze dry that stuff, and it's still infectious. As a matter of fact, you can take out the lipids, uh, and it loses infectivity, and add them back and regain the uh, the infectivity. It's that tough, okay? But it's not the uh, form of the virus that is transmitted from cell to cell, okay? There is a second envelope that is acquired that is used for getting the virus out of one cell and into another cell within an organism. So you can think of it as uh, the one envelope form as being uh, good for transmission from host to host, in particular because so, it's so environmentally stable. And the other form, the double envelope form, as being uh, important for cell to cell spread in the uh, host. Uh, reference TWIV 68, <laughs> Ode to a Plaque. Go listen to that. It's awesome. So, uh, Tecaviramat uh, interacts with one of the proteins that's involved in making the second envelope. 
So tecoviramat prevents the formation of that second envelope and therefore prevents spread. Um, Interestingly, for the aficionados out there, okay, if you take a bunch of virus that you have grown up and do a high multiplicity infection of a culture of cells in the presence of tecoviramat, you get a normal yield of virus at the other end. However, if you do a low multiplicity infection where you're dependent on spread from cell to cell to get a a normally high yield, tecoviramat will uh, inhibit the virus yield. When this first was being uh, looked at, um, uh, there were a lot of skeptics, myself included, uh, about whether or not something that inhibited spread would be effective, but it is quite So what they did in this study that's reported in this NIH press release, as it were, was it's a collaborative study between NIAID and some entities in the DRC, in the Congo. And they analyzed data from a randomized placebo-controlled trial, um, but they found a 1.7% overall mortality among the enrollees, regardless of whether or not they got the tecoviramat drug. And this 1.7% overall was much lower than the MPOX mortality, which is around 3.6% or higher, reported among all the cases in the DRC. And the take-home message is that these better outcomes of the people in the study was most likely, if if I interpret it correctly, because they were hospitalized and provided high-quality supportive care. So any of the studies that we're going to hear about, I think, going forward that include things in the Congo are going to need to be vetted or considered carefully as to whether or not they, everybody was getting the same kind of high-quality care mm. or what are, you, what are your comparators, in other words. Rich, um, could you just um, it, <clears throat> reinform me, at least, and maybe other people too, as to the origin of both of those envelopes? So they both encoded by the virus? The first one is assembled in a novel fashion directed by the virus, okay, right. uh, in the cytoplasm. Uh, the second one is acquired from uh, uh, intracellular membranes by essentially budding through uh, nice. intracellular membranes and then ultimately. So they're host. Uh, yeah. yeah ho- host heavily modified but with viral oh, proteins okay. and stuff. Okay. Okay. Decorated um, with uh, monkeypox. And uh, as a matter of fact, you know, I mean, obviously, I guess the, fir- the first membrane, even the lipid, comes from the host. Uh, but in uh, right. I- apparently itty bitty pieces, okay, you disassemble little <laughs> little bits of membrane and, and, and reuse this stuff, okay? It's not like taking a big sheet of membrane and using that to wrap the virus. Um, so uh, this really surprises me, okay? Because uh, monkeypox was one of the standard uh, test viruses used in the development of the drug. Okay, in particular, it's the you know it's the virus that in primates most closely resembles the smallpox disease. Though that's most closely that's qualified. Okay, it's it's not uh, you. You can't really establish a good respiratory infection with monkeypox in monkeys. Um, you have to basically uh, bypass the initial stages of the infection by uh, giving them a whole bunch of virus, I think, intravenously or something like that. But it does spread once it's established and gives you uh, symptomatology that's kind of like smallpox. And um, tecoviramat works against that. It works against the virus and culture and a bunch of different systems. It works in a bunch of uh, uh, different animal models and monkeypox. Monkeypox is closely enough related to all the other orthopox viruses that this is effective on so that this comes as a big surprise. However, a surprise. However, we know that mice lie, right? Mm-hmm. And monkeys exaggerate. Yes. So uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see more data on this, okay? I'm not ready to give up on this yet because it's just been so good in so many different systems. We'll see. 
It, it might also be worth looking back at those animal studies and asking, were the animals receiving high quality medical care equivalent? I mean, did you hook the monkeys up to an IV to rehydrate them? Did you, you know, do the kinds of things that would be the standard of care for humans participating in a clinical trial like this? Because those things may provide as much benefit as tecoviramat. Interesting. Yeah. They couldn't do that because they would. That would be monkeying around with the protocol. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I actually I um, I have talked to researchers who are starting to do this with mouse studies, where they set up a little mouse hospital, mm -hmm. and <laughs> and do and this is this is um, touches on a topic we talked about uh, a little while ago, trying to minimize the use of animals in research. It turns out you can get a lot more data per mouse if you keep the mouse alive the way you would a patient. Um, and you know, you do periodic blood tests and you monitor it and you, you don't just give the treatment and then see how many mice die. You, you approach it the way you would if you were administering a medicine in a hospital environment. And, um, it might be worth revisiting some other clinical trials that way. Well, the, part of the issue is that for animal protocols, if you lose so much weight, you have to. Yes. Then you have to euthanize the, you know, the animal. Right. So. You know, that's always reported as death, but it's not necessarily, you know, direct. Uh, we have an article from Public Health Agency of Sweden, one case of MPOX clade 1 reported in Sweden. This was a person who sought care at region Stockholm, the first case caused by clade 1 outside the African continent. The previous were 2B, and there had previously been 300 cases of 2B in Sweden. So this is what triggered... Uh, well, this uh, statement by the WHO. Uh, this, importantly, this one case was imported. The person imported, had been yes. traveling in yep. Central Africa and brought it home. And lastly, from Emerging Infectious Diseases, just published One Health Investigation into MPOX and Pets in the United States. So can MPOX virus infect companion animals? So they did... Uh, they collected animal and environmental swabs within homes of confirmed human MPOX case patients. And they looked for uh, MPOX virus and human DNA, uh, MPOX virus DNA and human DNA by PCR, looked for antibodies, 12% of animal and 25% of environmental swabs from four households, including four dogs and a cat, were positive for viral DNA, but no infectious virus, and no antibodies. So uh, this is, they say this is probably DNA contamination from the human case. And no no evidence that the companion animals were infected with uh, mpox virus, monkeypox virus. So that's good, but it's a small sample, right? Right. But good to look. It's good to look. I'm sure yep. we will look some more. Okay. Our first offering for you, speaking of non-companion animals, wild animals, <laughs> this is Nature Communications, widespread exposure to SARS-CoV-2 in wildlife communities from a group at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. Amanda Goldberg is the first author, and we have two uh, last authors, Carla Finkelstein and Joseph Hoyt. Can we have a summary? Sure, I'll do that. So overall, they've gone out and looked at wild animals from the wild. <laughs> and the results <laughs> suggest that areas that have high human activity may serve as points of contact that lead to cross-species transmission. In other words, they do find some uh, uh, evidence of SARS-CoV-2. They look both by RNA uh, and um, antibodies. And so they find it in uh, six different types of mammals by, uh, I think that was mostly by their DNA results. And then they have some other, oh, it was by their DNA results when they looked at two genes. And when they looked for only one gene, they found some additional ones. But the six New ones are the deer mouse, the possum, raccoon, groundhog, eastern cottontail rabbits, and eastern red bat. This is in addition to the white-tailed deer 
that we already knew about. And there had been a little bit of looking for wild animals in the wild in the past. Um, and so we knew about feral minks and river otters in addition to the white-tailed deer. So they do a lot of sampling at a couple of the locations in Virginia, a lot of them around Blacksburg, and then a lot of them up around the, um, looks like the DC area. And the bottom line is that they can detect it. And as we'll see, uh, they, they look at urban areas versus not so urban areas and where there's this closer overlap between people and animals, they see more of the uh, evidence of virus in the animals. And they also, they do some sequencing and they speculate that there might even be some evidence of animal to animal transmission and that there's a correlation with the particular variant that's circulating in humans at the time and what they see in the animals. So that's I, my summary. I, I want to just mention the name of feral mink, Neovision Vision, which is a great name, right? <laughs> Neovision. It's like a video game. Is it game, Neovision right? or Neovison? Neovison, right. Neo still bison. cool. Neovison, Vison. Yeah. 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 Neovison, Vison. And river otters are Lutra, Lutra. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so these are the three species, as Kathy said previously, shown to been infected. Of course, many captive animals are also as well. So this, this study tries to expand it. Um, other hairy domestic species have been shown to be infectable in the lab. That's uh, deer mice, skunks, for example. But what about uh, in the wild? So um, this study was done in um between may 2022 and september 2023 they had they used rt pcr and some neutralization assays to look at 789 nasopharyngeal or pharyngeal samples from 23 species sampled in virginia and washington dc they found rna in six of them they looked at 126 serum samples from six species and detected neutralizing antibody titers in five of the six species. This comes to mind now when maybe they should just look for binding antibodies, not just neutralizing, right? I don't know why maybe. it has to be, right, to be neutralizing, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the story. Yeah, they, they talk a little bit, I think they talk a little bit about that um, and how they chose neutralizing antibodies as a more stringent standard yeah. like with the rt pcr they're it in order to be considered positive it has to have two genes amplified up yeah. um from sars cov2 rather than just one because that's a sets a higher bar so i think they were just trying to be careful i think it's fine i guess if you have neutralizing antibodies you're most likely were inf productively yeah. infected so right. so just another piece of trivia to add to the double <laughs> names of wild animals naja naja is the uh, cobra <laughs> Nadia, Nadia, Nadja, Nadja, or right. Nadja, N A D I A, right? N A D J A, I believe. Oh, Nadja, cool. Okay, so now we're on a hunt for all species with the same name. <laughs> That's right. Isn't that would there? Be isn't great. there? Oh. Isn't it Radus Radus? Yeah, I think Radus right. Norvegicus. That's the Norwegian rat, of course. But the other one is Radus Radus. That's right. But uh, one of the great apes too. Is it gorilla? Gorilla? Yeah. <laughs> McKellar gorilla, I thought it was. <laughs> so, okay. uh, um, Go ahead. a couple of things um, stood out to me in this. First of all, that uh, the viruses that they found in these animals, they did this over a period of time, and the viruses that they found in the animal were in the animals were the same viruses that were circulating. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And they had sequences. Uh, that, uh, with one exception, actually matched the circulating viruses, okay, that they take as evidence that these have not been circulating in the animal populations for any significant period of time. And they, they, don't, they don't have enough data to draw a conclusion as to whether or not these are actually being transmitted yep. among the animals. But my, my sense is that they would probably lean towards, no, these are incidental infections that don't involve transmission. But we can... We can argue about that if you want. I think um, the other thing that I was thinking all the time is how do 
the animals get infected because they're right. not, we're not necessarily, you know, playing with these possums and that kind of stuff. And the impression that I get is that they figure that uh, basically the animals are uh, sorting through trash that humans leave behind. Yeah. So yeah. fomites, basically. <laughs> Yep, especially they find a correlation between um, seropositivity, uh, urbanization, and wildlife seroprevalence. And, you know, there there's a state park that had a high percentage of positives where people go, right? And they probably throw trash in the, in the waste buckets that are provided, so. Right, it was one, there was one not particularly urbanized area, which was a state park, which had a high antibody type, antibody rates prevalence. Yeah. Um, and the theory there is based on visitor numbers. This is a heavily visited park. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably somewhere along the Appalachian Trail. And, um, you know, a lot of people, so it might as well be an urban environment. But if you measure based on imperviousness, which is their standard for urbanization, so how much paved surface there is, there's not much. But it doesn't matter. You've got a lot of people and a lot of trash. Well, you can also say, I'm sorry, Kathy, you're going to say something. No, I was just going to comment on the imperviousness. It was a term I had not heard in this kind of context before. Yes. And so I, I had to sort of double check and make sure they were talking about impervious surfaces like pavement yes. and buildings right. and things would mm. count as that, as their indication of urbanization. And they show that on one of their maps of the Blacksburg Roanoke area. So when we discard something in nature, it usually finds a home somewhere else as another use. Birds, for instance, pick up all kinds of stuff that we throw away and incorporate them into their nests. Yeah. And so when we wipe the nose of a small child who's got a cold and we don't have any place to throw it and we don't want to stick it in our pocket, it usually ends up on the ground. So I think uh, that has probably got some role to play in this as well. I'm and reminded of campgrounds for sure. Yeah. I'm reminded of a close encounter I once had with a possum. All right. Uh, I was on the University of Florida campus, and I went to throw something into a trash can that yes. was open at the top. Yeah. And I, you know, leaned over to throw the thing in, and there was this great, f scary <laughs> hissing sound <laughs> that came from the bottom of the trash can, and there, curled up in the bottom of the trash can, was a was a possum. Exactly. Saying basically. Uh, get out of here. This is my <laughs> trash my can, trash. Dan. <laughs> I'm surprised that he displaced Oscar in order to do that. By the way. Could well, he get out? Of he, he displaced me for was sure. Was it stuck or could he? Could it get out? What, what you know? Get out easily. Uh, I wasn't going to stick around and find out. Probably he could get out. Yeah, they are very good there. climbers. Yeah. So I was just thinking about this trash issue. You know, I'm thinking maybe we shouldn't put waste baskets, but Probably a lot of people are just throwing it on the ground anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, you right. have to have trash cans. So I, I can just see a letter coming into our august body of uh, knowledgeable people saying, you guys just sit around and talk about trash all day. You just trash talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but if you have trash buckets, that's great, but the animals will go in it, as yeah. it's just said. So you can't win. No. I'm just thinking New York City, we don't have many trash cans anymore. Really? I think a, a, an opossum <laughs> group is the only universally distributed, um, um, oh, come on, that word just disappeared from my head. You know what I'm talking about. Pouched animals that run around. Marsupials. marsupials. It's the only marsupial that's it's distributed on us, all seven continents. Hmm. Uh, the opossum and its relatives. All right. So as Kathy said, we had eight deer mice, four Virginia opossums, four raccoons, three eastern cottontail rabbits, three groundhogs, and one eastern no, red no. bat. No partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> no, <laughs> not this time. And that, that was by Too that bad. was by PCR. You can shut me off any time you want today. I'm just in a terrible fix. And, and then they found antibodies in five of these six species: um, eastern gray squirrel, white-footed mouse, mouse, and deer mouse. And then they had other samples: raccoons, opossum, white-footed mouse that had. Uh, neutralization at lower rates. They also mentioned that they had one-offs, many one positive animals, but they didn't count those. You know, they wanted to have multiple positives. And those included, let's find it, because I know you like to hear about 
Wolverines. <laughs> the the paper both papers we're talking about today, by the way, are open access. Yeah. So if there's something we yeah, didn't we cover go. that you wanted to find out about, it's uh, the American dynamite. Beaver, the Bobcat, the American Black Bear, the Red Fox, the White Tailed Deer, the Skunk, and the Eastern Gray Squirrel. Bobcat. Those were the ones where they were looking at just a single gene. Single, single gene positive. Yeah. yeah. Right. Instead of two. Um, as, as we've already said, there's correlations with either urbanization or parks where people go. As Rich said, the, the strains, the variants that they detect match what was circulating in people. We, we cannot tell if these are transmitting in the animals. Um, and they do find some changes that are unique to, uh, wildlife that aren't seen in humans. We don't know what they do. They, you know, when viruses go to a different host, they, their genome sequences are changed because they're initially a quasi species. They go in, and some some member of that quasi species probably is amplified, so they find a spike amino acid change. Um, yep. And so we're going to they, they, they like to think that these are important, but there's no evidence that they make any difference. Whatsoever. We're going to see a lot of this, by the way, because a lot I of think what? a lot of peri domestication. Oh, sure. Sure. I would call it peri-domestication. So at what point does a wild animal become a non-wild, peri-domestic, sort of a quasi-member of the family? When the raccoons come out, you feed them, they become your friends, the deer, you're, you've got a location. You're still wild animals, Dixon. Well, you know, they are and they are not. I mean, they don't behave anymore like a wild animal. They're not afraid of things. Okay. It's, kind of, a, of a lot of it's kind of a gray boundary, there's I a, think. It's not well defined. In one of those widely read uh, <clears throat> Yahoo News blurbs, but I believed it, a woman was out wa walking her boxer dog in a Los Angeles county, and a mountain lion jumped out and ate it. And she stood there and watched that happen. Yeah, that's too bad. And that's pretty peri domestic when, it, <laughs> when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Didn't hurt her. Didn't want. Didn't want you. She said, "I only eat four-legged animals. Thank you. You can go home." Well, as but, you know, with population growth, we're impinging on wildlife. But absolutely. So, so we're incorporating them into our daily lives. Yeah. That's basically it, including our diseases. There's always a case or two every year of somebody walking their dog in Florida near a pond. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, alligator. You can only yeah, yeah. guess what might have happened next. By uh, the way, so, the, pyth so, um, the python hunt is on in Florida right now. Yes. Just, just an anecdotal deer story. Uh, there, there are a lot of uh, fawns now because they... Earthing season was not long ago. I was walking around and I, I got between the mother and the fawn, right? Ooh, not a good thing. So the fawn started running away, but then it stopped. It has this this foot signal. It taps to tell the mother that it's in trouble. It like stomps its feet a number of times. And I said, hmm. oh, well, just cool, man. I'm not going to bother you. <laughs> Chill. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I like that. It was fun. I think one, two, and then three is like, I'm in trouble, mom. Come help me. Something. Exactly. I think that's great. Um, but the real issue here is how extensive is it? This is, this is Virginia and DC. We, you know, we should look elsewhere. And are variants arising that could pose threats to people in the sense that they would antigenically change and so forth or whatever? We don't have any evidence for that. But that's when you have a huge reservoir like this, that's what's the story with influenza viruses, right? All kinds of aquatic and other birds are full of influenza viruses and uh, they, they, there's threats to us. So we need to know if this is the case. It's really remarkable that this virus infects so many hosts. Yeah, yeah. I was I was thinking about that because, um, you know, for a while I was thinking, wow, this thing's really pretty promiscuous. On the other hand, it's there's no evidence that it's uh, being transmitted or replicating mm. to the point. Certainly, it's replicating enough so that you can get genomic RNA out of it, and yeah, you can yeah. get uh, antibodies, okay? But there's not a lot going on. And, you know, this may be, among other things, a, a case of we're looking really hard, okay? And you have to wonder how many other viruses that you think uh, that you uh, can regard as being fairly uh, strictly species restricted are doing the same thing, probing yeah. the biosphere all the time. You bet. Uh, and getting away with a little bit, but not enough. You yeah, were. these spillbacks are probably more common than we thought, just like spillovers are more common than we thought. Sure. On the other hand, um, I think there's some pretty good evidence that in white-tailed deer, at least, it does spread yeah. animal to animal. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And here, the study, I mean, you can't follow these animals. They do actually, I think there were a couple of animals they recaptured because they tag them after they trap them. Um, but uh, you need you'd need a much more extensive trapping program to do that reliably and track them over time and see if they get reinfected or yeah, yeah. track the variants. Um, you know, this is a great start. This is a, a good place to begin with it. But um, yeah, we don't know if these animals are transmitting it among themselves. We don't, but West Nile does among crows. Yeah, sure. And other, um, you know, corbidae. So, um... by the way, is it unusual to know that cats are can be infected with H5N1? Is that a known fact, or did you just mm. find that out? Yeah, it's known. It is known. Okay, fine. Yeah. I just read that for the first time. Yeah. Sure. So nine species so far. Wow. Can be infected with SARS-CoV-2, but that's just tip of the iceberg. Going to be many can, more. Can be infected with it in the wild. You mean? In the wild, yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's that's good. That's actually an easy paper because the next one is a bear. <laughs> yeah. And it's a second plant virus paper in a row. From last week, we had one. This one is Nature Communications: Plant Viruses Exploit. No. Nope. No exploiting. Sorry. Insect salivary gap DH to modulate plant defenses. Gap DH is like a control on a, on a protein gel, right? right? right. <laughs> now it's got some importance. So uh, I, I feel obliged <laughs> to jump in like Richwood for his Pox viruses. Hold on. Uh, let me just tell you the authors. Hang Pox, on. Yeah. Okay. We got, uh, these are all from the State Key Laboratory of Ecological Pest Control for Fujian and Taiwan Crops in the Fujian Agriculture and Forestry University in Fujian, China. And right. so we have uh, Xin Wang and Haibo Wu. First two authors contributed equally, and then Shan Chen is the last author. Okay. What were you going to say, Dixon? Uh, what I was going to say was that this is a vector-borne infection. And I wanted to talk about the vector for a moment because leafhoppers are some of the most beautiful insects in the world. Uh, they're part of the larger group of hemipterans or true bugs. They have sucking mouth parts. They're related to reduvidae, Vincent. <laughs> they're related to um, bed bugs, of course. And uh, they suck plant juices, basically. That's how they make their living. And they're called leafhoppers because just try to catch one sometime. They're very small. And, you know, if you're out to collect them for whatever, for this study or others, uh, they will es escape 99% of the time. They, they can anticipate when to jump instantly, and they're remarkable in their biology. Um, I find them fascinating animals because they come up so many times in so many other instances as well to talk about the transmission of plant diseases from plant to plant. And obviously, this is a, a good pick. So thank you, Vincent, for picking that. Yeah, uh, Rich, these did are, you... um, they're very important plant pests in agriculture. And the one they're going to be talking about yeah. here, yeah. Um, the Ricilia dorsalis, is a very common pest of rice. Exactly. So, Rich, you want to give us the summary here? Uh, yeah, I will make an attempt. Um, so I had to write my own little summary to see if <laughs> I could... Uh, figure this out. First of all, since this is uh, open access for anybody who is uh, interested in it, I would go right to figure seven, which is their graphic model of yes. what's going on. And uh, with a little bit of introduction here, uh, that might at least keep some of the uh, players straight. So uh, I, I want to, and this is extraordinarily convoluted. So I wanted to try and deconvolute a little bit at different levels. Okay. So let's start at the uh, highest level. As Dixon uh, uh, started to introduce, this is a, uh, there are three players here, three biological players, an insect, a plant, and a virus. So it's very similar to a situation like dengue that replicates in, in mosquitoes uh, and in vertebrate animals, okay? In this case, the uh, insect is a plant hopper, the plant, the experimental plant is a rice plant, and the virus is, I don't even remember the name of this thing, do you know? 
Doesn't matter. Uh, we'll get to it. It's a virus. We'll get to it's it. It's a real yeah. virus for them. Rice okay. gold rice gold dwarf, dwarf virus, virus. RGDV. And one of the things that fascinates me about all such systems is that this virus replicates both in the insect and in the plants. And those critters are different enough from each other that, in my mind at least, uh, uh, accomplishing a replication in both hosts uh, is a fairly neat trick. Okay, um, So that's level one. It's a three three-part system. Level two. The plant uh, defends itself against attack from the insect. Uh, so it has, uh, it has defenses. The insect has countermeasures. It does things to try and suppress the uh, defenses set up by the plant. In this particular case, the virus in the insect kind of ramps up the uh, insect countermeasures a little bit, okay, to make the make it so that the inf insect has, it's replicating in the salivary, salivary glands, the viruses, and it's going to go into the plant, okay, makes it so that the defenses that the insect sets up are better, so that gives the insect more feeding time and the virus uh, a better chance to grow. So the virus is ramping up the insect's uh, countermeasures to its own benefit. So another level. In this particular case, the plant defense is hydrogen peroxide, which is a, reaction, a reactive oxygen species. Okay? So the plants, uh, and, and these things, reactive oxygen species are just basically toxic. Okay? So the, the plant reacts to the insult by the insect by uh, elevating levels of hydrogen peroxide. The countermeasure from the insect is this protein that Vincent already measured called GAP-DH. Um, glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase. Uh, the day job of this enzyme is in glycolysis. It's an essential step in glycolysis, that is breaking down glucose and getting energy out of it, okay? But it has a side job, a night job, uh, which is to uh, work as a, a suppressor of uh, these sorts of defenses that involve reaction oxygen, uh, reactive oxygen species because it has a couple of cysteines in it that are sulfhydryl groups which will react with the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and basically deactivated. So I think of the gap DH as a hydrogen peroxide sink. So Rich, right. you want to call this enzyme the enzyme that never sleeps? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So okay, okay. to summarize summarize that bit, uh, the insect ramps up its production of uh, gap DH. The virus the virus in the insect ramps it up even more, so that when the insect bites into the plant, and the plant responds with hydrogen peroxide, the uh, insect is not only mounting a defense, but even a better defense with the virus there because the virus has wrapped, uh, ramped all this up, okay? One more level of complexities, and there's even more after this, I think, okay, is that it's complicated by the fact that um, if the GAP-DH um, gets... Uh, heavily oxidized by the uh, hydrogen peroxide, it has a tendency to dimerize, okay? And that is thought to be toxic to the plant. And the plant would like to not do that. So it induces a reducing agent called glutathione as a, what I would call a counter-counter measure, okay? Uh, that's a kind of a sideshow in a way, but it's uh, part of this whole thing. So it's it's a little bit like, the plant doesn't want to overreact because it's yes. like its immune system would be worse than the actual. Right. So this right. is a, this is it's a, like IL-10. This is a <laughs> multi-level, multi-level, multi-levels of complexity, uh, uh, attack, defense thing, a tug of war between the insect and the plant that the virus is, uh, piggybacking on. Okay. To try and, uh, 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 gain some benefit. I realize that's a little 
anthropomorphic, but, um, and, uh, so like I said, it's, um, uh, multi-leveled the details oh, are mm -hmm. uh, considerable. You know, go for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So how, for, did, for, did that make sense guys? That, yeah, yeah, really yeah, good made a lot of sense. Yes. Good. And I just want to, I just want to, um, throw in a little warning for the paper is open access, but it is not easily accessible. <laughs> yes. Um, it's unlike the previous paper we talked about on this show, yeah. this, this is, we're going deep into the weeds here and not just the rice. Um, this is spy yeah. versus spy versus spy. And it's, versus spy. I like the way Rich summarized it in layers because mm -hmm. it is like that. So if you're reading this paper and thinking, oh gosh, I, I don't understand science. I'm never going to understand these papers if I can't understand this one. No, this is a particularly difficult paper. Well, there's a lot of um, references to plant anatomy, and uh, hardly anybody that I know, in this room at least, uh, yeah. is familiar with plant anatomy. <laughs> I, I Except, remember learning I about leaves. xylem and phloem leaves. in a botany course. Yeah. There's a leaf. Thicks and I know leaves. xylem and phloem. <laughs> yes, xylem, xylem and phloem. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Plasma, plasma desmata. Yeah, oh, that's right. That's why. Look at you. Look at you. Okay, well, some I take of this. All back. This is relevant yeah. to viruses, Dixon. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I hear you. In fact, the, the textbook we have a little bit of information about this. Okay. So I, Bates, I suppose we should also say that this is just one example. Oh yes. Of yes. you know a myriad of different tugs of war that are going on. Okay. That these things are, but they've had four billion years to think about it. Okay. So there you go. So, but so he's set this up. Uh, the the insect feeds on the plant, the plant initiates defenses, the um, insects try to counter them, and the viruses take advantage of not to take advantage, but um, are, are their replication is facilitated uh, by these responses. And G A D G A P D H gap D H is a central player here. It's in the saliva of many insects, including leafhoppers. Um, and so it can, you know, it's a good sensor of hydrogen peroxide. Um, it can, in theory, do do have a function in these insects that are biting plants, but it hasn't been explored before this paper, right? So this paper really tells us what gap DH is doing. And the system they use, the virus rice gall dwarf virus, RGDV, it's a real virus, a double-stranded RNA virus. Uh, it's it uh, infects rice hosts and it's transmitted by the leafhopper Resilia dorsalis. Uh, it, it's uh, it's the infection is called a persistent propagative manner. It's a twelve to fourteen day latent period. Uh, while the virus is uh, in the salivary gland, uh, it reduces secretion of salivary calcium binding proteins to plants. That that therefore regulates transmission uh, of the virus. It also apparently uh, takes advantage of gap DH um, of the leafhopper, so it's R D gap DH, to cause autophagy in the alimentary canal, uh, and that pers that promotes persistent infection uh, by the virus. So it doesn't doesn't hurt the uh, leafhopper, but it cause it to be infected a long time, and that facilitates uh, the transmission of the virus, of course. And so, as Rich said, this paper is going to show that the virus RGDV uh, uses RDGAPDH to suppress hydrogen peroxide, which is produced by the rice host, right? And that allows the virus to be transmitted. A lot and of experiments... Reason this the reason gap dh name got longer and it's rd gap dh is because <laughs> there's also gap dh produced by the rice plant right which um <laughs> is uh oriza sativa i think so it's os yeah, gap dh right. so uh, that's going to come up later too and a subtlety here uh check me if you disagree uh is that it's not like um the virus in ramping up the uh, insect defense is having a direct effect on its ability to replicate in the plant. Okay. Uh, it's kind of, well, I, I guess there is some direct effect in that. Well, no, because the, the, uh, the effect of the hydrogen peroxide 
is basically it tastes bad to the leaf hopper. So the leaf hopper, you know, doesn't stick around. It goes mm. and uh, uh, tries somewhere else, then tries somewhere else. So it spends less time sucking on the plant. So if you can suppress that bad taste, you have a better opportunity uh, to infect the plant. Uh, so um, it's as if the effect of the virus in wrapping, uh, ramping up that, uh, that uh, defense is to uh, really um, uh, influence the behavior of the leafhopper, okay? Yes. And then indirectly facilitate the transmission of the virus. Is that, does that ring true? Mm -hmm. Sounds right to me. Correct. So the first set of experiments, there are a lot of experiments here. We're not going to cover them all. It's just too much. In fact, it would take us months. Um, I yeah. have to. Well, we're yeah, this give is over. this paper is a heck of a lot of work. A lot oh, of yeah. experiments of different of sorts, and and we can't tell you every experiment. It would take too long. They do a lot of different things. First, they show that when uh, when R. dorsalis feeds on rice, R. gap DH is in fact released with the saliva into the rice plants, right? Doing Western blots and so forth. They they show that, and they figure out that the rd gap dh in the salivary gland is loaded into exosomes little vesicles that are produced from cells they're made in the cell and then they they, they uh, butt off or they're released at the plasma membrane they have lots of things in them and one of the things they contain is rd gap dh and so released into the saliva the insect bites the plant and the saliva goes in to the plant into the phloem with the rd gap dh as well as other things and in fact, they knock down the RD gap DH gene, and they show that there's less protein in salivary glands. They use, they use an inhibitor of exosome biogenesis, and they show that that knocks down RD gap DH in saliva. So that shows that exosomes are the way that the RD gap DH gets out of cells. Now, what about the virus RGDV? They asked. What does that do on salivary RD gap DH? So they do Western blots and so forth. And in fact, they show infection increases the production of RD gap DH in the salivary glands, and there's more in the saliva, and there's more in the rice plant if uh, it's infected with a virus. All right, so RGDB infection enhances the accumulation of um, RD gap DH. So RD gap DH is the leaf hopper gap DH. So virus infection right. of the leaf hopper increases the production of RD gap DH. Okay. So then they say, um, let's take a look at hydrogen peroxide. If you expose <laughs> expose plants to R. dorsalis, the leafhopper, you get an increase in hydrogen peroxide in the, in the plant. So it's a defense against the insect. Also get a, 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 a um, metabolite of hydrogen peroxide, melondialdehyde, MDA. And um, so basically they're saying this must be involved in defense against the leafhopper, right? Because it's within 12 hours of the leafhopper biting. And in fact, they show that there's a lot of hydrogen peroxide at the feeding sites, right? So that's what Rich was saying before. The leafhopper doesn't like the peroxide, so it will go somewhere else. But, but basically, the exposure of the plant to the leafhopper causes the burst of hydrogen peroxide production. So then they say, what is the role of RD gap DH in RD in the leafhopper? Does it counter hydrogen peroxide? So they knock down. RD gap DH in the leaf hopper, and what do you think happens to hydrogen peroxide in the in the rice? It goes up. Yes, Dixon, did you was that up? He was okay. pointing up. Pointing up could be one also, right? So you take away the RD gap DH, the hydrogen peroxide goes up. So you conclude that the RD gap is a so is an effector that suppresses somehow the bursts of hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> in the plant. Very complicated. And it gets more and more complicated. Um, if you knock down um, 
RD gap DH in the white fly, uh, they probe more. Right? They're looking for better places because they can't counter the hydrogen peroxide anymore. Right. So they take, um, <laughs> I mean, some of these assays are really involved and cool, but <laughs> they, they score the, um, the number of feeding sites. Right. So the, the leaf hopper goes and it sticks its beak in, or it's, uh, what is it, stylet, I think, into the, the plant and drinks a little bit. Um, and you see how long or how many times it finds a new site. And it goes and shops for new sites a lot more in these cases where you've knocked down RDGAP DH and you've got higher hydrogen peroxide. So that's all consistent with this repelling the insect. This I had a little trouble getting my head around this. It was to me counterintuitive. If the if the if the bug is probing more, I would think it's feeding more, but it's not spending much it's time not. at each with each probe. Mm. It's right. like, ooh, that tastes bad. I'm going yeah. somewhere else. It's like fleas with plague. They're blocked and they can't feed, so they keep biting and biting and biting it, trying right. to get food, but they can't get it. Great. And they Sorry. regurgitate, right? And they regurgitate. So I just wanted a one little technical thing because this blew my mind and I had to look it up. <laughs> Knocking down RD gap DH in the leaf hopper. Right. They take third in star uh leaf hoppers. So these are uh uh these are larvae. Okay, but they look like this is an incomplete metamorphosis. Yeah, so they I think look these like are nymphs. They're nymphs. That's right. <laughs> that's that's what it is. They look like, you know, bugs. Okay, right. but they're not totally adult. That's right. And they inject them one by one into the thorax with double-stranded RNA. The adult of this complex. animal is about the size of a grain of rice. That's correct. <laughs> and that they do right. these ultimately Look, they throughout do. the paper on, by the hundreds. They do in vitro fertilization on eggs. Yeah. They, this is a piece of cake. Uh, oh, listen, well, you do you it, gotta, then, Dixon. You got to <laughs> really, you got to really want the answer to do these experiments. Yeah, no, that's exactly why they get paid a lot of money for this. Rice well, I don't know about deal. that, but <laughs> well, I think this institute gets a lot of support for rice work. Yes, of course. So RD gap DH suppresses hydrogen peroxide that's made by the rice, right? Which is made in response to the insect biting, and the insect makes RD gap DH to suppress it so that they can feed. You got it. So far, there's no virus here. Nope. <laughs> so what about the virus? <laughs> Let's see, what happens if the, if you add the virus to the equation here? They want to know what's the, what is the rice host? How does the rice host respond to RGDV infected leaf hopper? So they expose, uh, plants to the infected leaf up for 12 hours, what do you think happens? H2O2 goes up. And so it's, it's basically the same as if you had an uninfected. Um, it actually goes up more, but more when an infected bug bites than when an uninfected bug bites. Yeah. Which was confusing to me at first because then they're going to talk about the difference with and without knocking down um, gap D, <laughs> RD gap DH. Um, yeah. Anyway. So, um, they yes, as, as Alan said, enhanced hydrogen peroxide burst and RD gap DH accumulation are found at feeding sites when you look at infected versus uninfected R dorsalis. And they say this suggests that the plants are defending with hydrogen peroxide uh, with, with, against the, the virus-infected leafhopper. They also looked at the number of feeding sites. If the virus is present in the leafhopper, you get more feeding sites than virus-free. Again, because um, you're getting more hydrogen peroxide produced, right? And so the leafhopper is going to different places. So then they knocked down RD gap DH on and, and ask what, what's the effect on release of the virus from the leafhopper. So knockdown of RD gap DH reduces this protein, uh, P8, a viral protein, uh, in its accumulation in salivary glands and its release into the rice plant. 
And if you had, if you knock down the uh, RD gap DH, you get higher levels of hydrogen peroxide and greater numbers of feeding sites. So basically, um, you have even more difficult feeding of uh, or of of gap DH knocked down uh, plants when the virus is present. So they they believe that uh, RD gap DH induced by the virus facilitates feeding of the insect, which it makes sense, right? Because that's how you yeah. get better propagation. Yeah. So the the uninfected um, R. dorsalis feeds at a decent rate. The infected one has a more difficult time because there's more hydrogen peroxide being produced in the plant with the infected bug. And if you knock down R. D. gap DH, it has an even harder time because there's even more hydrogen peroxide being produced. So the virus seems to be partially compensating for the uh, effect that it has that would otherwise inhibit the feeding of its host. Right. They also look at the effect of knocking down um, RD gap DH on virus transmission. And in fact, um, if you knock down, you get less virus transmission. So RD gap DH promotes transmission by promoting feeding, right? Um, and so it's a RD gap DH is basically a salivary effector that enhances feeding of the leafhopper and therefore by by neutralizing hydrogen peroxide and therefore promotes virus transmission should that leafhopper be infected, right? They make transgenic plants that overproduce RD gap gap, gap DH. Okay. <laughs> And so they, they, they do a number of experiments in these. Um, when you expose them to virus-free leafhopper, they have lower levels of peroxide, um, um, lower peroxide at feeding sites um, compared to wild-type plants, and um, the number of feeding sites are lower. I already said that. So, so this is gourmet rice for the <laughs> bugs. Right. So making more... Um, allows the insect to better feed, right? Because it's even better neutralizing. And in fact, they show that in these transgenic plants, overproduction of RD gap DH decreases even further hydrogen peroxide levels of the rice host. And it also decreases probing because they probe and they, they bite and they say, this is good, it tastes good. We don't have to move on, right? So the more RD gap DH, the better. So RD gap DH is an effector that suppresses peroxide and facilitates feeding. They also looked at transmission in these transgenic plants. Um, these, these plants seem to trans, these um, exposure of virus infected leafhopper to these transgenic plants appears to result in greater transmission from the leafhopper to the plant. I, mean, I get confused. I got three things to deal with. Here. Yes. <laughs> it shouldn't be a problem, but it is. Um, so the, the overexpression of RD gap DH seems to improve viral release to the plants. Um, and these plants have lower numbers of feeding sites compared to wild type plants. They have lower probing frequency of the, of the insects, shorter duration of probing. So making more um, RD gap DH facilitates feeding. Now, this is an experiment. It's not like you're going to make crops like this, right? You don't want to do that, but well, you want no, to understand. You wouldn't it's, want to make more susceptible crops. No, but you just want to make, um, you want to understand the role so you make transgenic plants. Um, then there's a whole series of experiments where they want to know how gap DH takes care of hydrogen peroxide. And all I'm going to say it's the sulfhydryl groups. Yes. <laughs> if that's okay. Because yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah. There are lots of sulfhydryl groups, and they look at them in all kinds of biochemical ways. Um, they do in vitro and in plant studies to look at this. And they conclude that yes, the sulfhydryl groups of gap DH, and how many are there? There are um, two that they mess with. The two right. cysteine residues with sulfhydryl, right. And they they mess with them, and they when you mess, if you take them away, you can't get rid of uh, hydrogen so peroxide. So long road to a short answer. Yeah, I mean a lot of great chemistry and biochemistry here, but uh, I think the conclusion is that uh, 
it's uh, it's the sulfhydryl group. Now, interestingly, um, when you um, when when GAPDH takes care of uh, hydrogen peroxide, it gets it, it's it's bad for it. It you you basically lose the protein once it's sopped up some hydrogen peroxide. They form dimers, and these are dif disulfide bonded dimers, right? Because the SHs are being reduced, they're being joined, and then the hydrogen peroxide is being taken care of. So you get dimers of, of gap DH, and this causes um, cytotoxicity in the plant. And they they say, we know that when insects bite plants, they often get withered um, and wilted. And this is probably the mechanism because the plant uh, is making hydrogen peroxide. The RD gap DH is coming in and neutralizing, and that's dimerizing and accumulating and causing cell death. There's some, uh, I don't know how much is speculation and how much is evidence that these dimers aggregate uh, and sort of, uh, so we get, I, I think of them as precipitating. I think of it as like, amyloid plaques exactly yeah. exactly right yeah uh, and that those sort of aggregates being toxic it's interesting none of this would have been known if we had not domesticated rice <laughs> because in nature this is a trivial pursuit type of thing but in uh, commercial uh, crop production this is big 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 money so they, they do they make this statement just those, but in the field, we don't always see withered and wilting plants that are bitten by leafhoppers or other insects, right? In rice. So what's going on? So this is where glutathione comes in. And so it turns out that uh, glutathione, uh, GSH, um, what does it stand for? Remind me. It's just gluta and the SH thione. Yeah. Glutathione SH, yeah. right? It's not an enzyme, right? No. It's a so GSH competes <laughs> with peroxide to glutathionate the gap DH. So it doesn't dimerize and it doesn't precipitate and cause this cell death. Right. So only under conditions where you don't have a lot of GSH uh, is it a problem. But in the field, the plants have adapted um, GSH to take care of that. Um and if you're interested, S-glutathionation of GAP-DH by GSH is likely involved in alleviating the oxidation. And exposure to the virus-infected leafhoppers also induces GSH accumulation. I haven't told you, but they looked at that. And in fact, when the virus is present, it induces GSH, which is brilliant because it prevents the, the host from wilting and withering. And that allows virus to reproduce, right? If the host dies, yep. the virus can't reproduce. Yeah, yeah. So many years yeah, of evolution made this. Right. It's <laughs> keeping it from overdoing it, keeping the host from... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. If you want to know what the uh, most disastrous rice plant disease is, though, mm -hmm. it's not a virus, it's a fungus. And it's it's a called rice blast. Hmm. And uh, it wipes out two-thirds of the crops of Thailand and... Vietnam and perhaps southern China. Is That's bad, right? Because it's a main, airport. main. It's a big staple, right? Huge. Uh, Thailand used to export rice. Now they buy it. Ah. Uh. Yeah, exactly right. Where does that come from? It comes from places like the United States or uh, Australia, places like that. And they used to have an, a, a national economy built on it. Hmm. Okay. Then they do an experiment where they treat rice with an inhibitor of GSH biosynthesis, right? And then they expose them to leafhoppers. And of course, this um, reduces the ability to um, keep RD gap DH in, in a monomeric form. Right? They, they, they accumulate as dimers in these treated seedlings. So another piece of evidence that GSH competes with peroxide to alleviate the toxicity of uh, RD gap DH dimerization. They also did this with another with another insect to show that in a different insect this the same thing is going on. Um, gap DH is important 
for um, neutralizing the hydrogen peroxide. Yeah. So salivary gap DHs of these insects, hemipterans, can uh, suppress hydrogen peroxide and facilitate insect feeding, which facilitates virus reproduction. And the virus plays into this by further inducing the uh, RD gap DH. They, they do a pretty good job of summarizing results after each section, um, but they started to all sound the same to me. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, the results indicate that RGDV infection enhances the gap DH accumulation in salivary glands and its release to rice plants through exosomes. That was the first one. And then the next one, uh, taken together, the results indicate that the gap DH serves as an effector that suppresses hydrogen peroxide burst in the rice host thus facilitating the leafhopper feeding. And then next one, GAP-DH acts as a salivary effector that enhances the leafhopper feeding, thus promoting virus transmission. And then there's another one that's going to say yep, yep. pretty much the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I did get the overall picture, but Rich's explanation helped really uh, sort it out for me after the, the fact. The problem I have with all these kinds of papers is that it's, Multiple negatives. It's a whole chain of negatives. Yeah. This inhibits <laughs> yes. that, but this this other thing inhibits that, and this other thing inhibits that. So where are we? Okay. Yeah. Right. But it's you know, not, this not, is, not, not that. This is it. It's a war. Yeah. You got that right. So they have a nice uh, figure, as, as yeah. we pointed out earlier. And let me just summarize it at the end here. This is their model. How RGDV induces RD gap DH to consume hydrogen peroxide in rice plants for viral transmission. So salivary RD gap DH is loaded into exosomes. It it uh, when the insect feeds, it's delivered. Feeding induces hydrogen peroxide. The released RD gap DH reduces the peroxide level uh, owing to its sulfhydryl group reacting with hydrogen peroxide that facilitates feeding. When gap DH becomes overoxidized, it makes dimers, which are cytotoxic. To prevent that, the cells launch what they call an emergency defense by making more GSH to S glutathionate RD gap DH, and that uh, eliminates the cytotoxicity. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Very cool. Congratulations, gang. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do some email here. We have a bunch. We'll just do a round, I think. Let's see. Um, uh, Dixon, can you take that first one? You bet. <laughs> Jay writes, hi, Twiv. <clears throat> I've just gotten into this show, and I'm already a huge fan. Totally random, but I just wanted to say that thrips and chromothripsis are thought to be connected. They are cognates, as in jargon. Uh, throughout the ancient Greek world, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that Greek word, um, but it's uh, you know a bunch of Greek letters. Uh, tribo, it's in parentheses, it says tribo. And that the Wiktionary pages were just unclearly organized. These are also connected to the words monotreme, uh, which is a um, egg-laying mammal that lives in Australia, <laughs> like uh, echidnas and uh, platypi. platypi. Uh, and triboelectricity, really? And if you go very far back to Proto-Indo-European, I see why you had me read this, trout and dreidel. 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 Dreidel, 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 dreidel. It's a little toy yes. that you use atop. Yeah, With it, string. I will play. Yeah. With the string. <laughs> okay, so, Jay, you obviously Jay. get it. Okay. <laughs> yes. This is this is excellent, excellent trivia. Uh, yes. Yeah. God, you join our group if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Yes. Rodney writes: For clarity, I and others may appreciate acronym definitions that are not so common, such as, uh, in other words, the common ones are DNA PCR and RT PCR. An acronym such as MECFS that was used in the Dr. Brookfeld interview in episode 1139 is an example. There was another one in that episode I assume dealt with a physical condition for PT therapy, but it's a guess from what was being discussed at that point. Other such uncommon undefined terms or named undefined summaries effects were mentioned in the past. The suggestion that I propose is to have an additional line or two below the links 
for these types of acronyms. It allows for non-experts in the field to learn more. For MECFS, all that would be needed is below. It tells how it fits into the discussion at the point of the long COVID symptoms 11, in 1139 and what it signifies. And he gives an example. MECFS, colon, myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. Many thanks for your efforts on these sessions. They are great. Rodney. I think it's a good idea. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you Expand know, the acronyms. When, uh, just as, uh, as a practical example, reading this paper that we just did, it had a bunch <laughs> of acronyms in it. Yeah. Okay. And I had to, you know, I would get into the paper and uh, a, a little ways and this acronym kept coming up and I said, what the heck does that mean? And I would have to stick the mm -hmm. acronym into the search function and go backwards until I found, uh, found, found it where defined. it was defined. But at least these guys, uh, in the first instance of the use of the acronym, defined it pretty reproducibly every time. And that's what we ought to be doing orally. Yeah. If you use an acronym, define it. Yeah, I, I, I knew in that interview when these came up, I should have defined them. But, you know, when you're talking to someone, you kind of don't want to interrupt you don't I want think, to break the flow. By the right. way, MECFS is, and the other one was POTS, which yeah. mm -hmm. postural orthostatic tachycardia <laughs> syndrome, right? I you think that a, was expanded out when I was. listened to it. I think so. Yes. But I, I, see, I think it's uh, a good idea. You see good uh, newscasters do this when they're interviewing somebody. Yeah, They'll yeah. stop them midstream and say, what you mean is this, right? Yeah. yeah. Usually you start off by saying, please help us understand. <laughs> uh, Rich, can you take the next one? So, uh, James, correct? Yep. Yep. Uh, dear Vincent and Daniel, I wanted to thank you and Dr. Griffin for mentioning the JVI commentary, quote, the harm of promoting the lab leak hypothesis for SARS-CoV-2 without evidence, end quote, that Felicia Goodrum and I wrote with the help and expertise of others. This is, oh, this is Jim Allwine. Yep. You had suggested that the piece would not be widely seen because it's published in a scientific journal. Ironically, JVI has turned out to be a great place to publish these sorts of commentaries. No paywall. We can have as many authors as we want to include no word limits, and we can really reference things. Plus, ASM has a direct line to Congress where these do uh, get pumped. Additionally, uh, these are written for scientists, so they have the talking points and references. We have written a shorter version of this commentary as an op-ed to mainstream <laughs> media. It has been rejected by the Washington Post, LA Times, and others. We have encouraged all the other 40-some authors who signed on to the commentary to uh, take it and create their own op-ed. The New York Times has gotten several versions from different people and rejected them all. Stat did publish one, and he gives a link to this basically uh, op-ed that one could use, I, I guess, as a template to uh, make your own. Felicia and I would really like to see this more strongly represented in the mainstream media, but it is very tough. Presentation of the science and facts on zoonosis and uh, in a way that is edgy or confrontational enough to grab the New York Times, uh, Washington Post, or LA Times readers has eluded us. Maybe because we don't want to write that way. Unfortunately, it's a battle of narratives that science and zoonosis have been losing. But Felicia and I have written nearly 40 op-eds and commentaries over the past four years. Uh, we think it's vital to write. One reason for doing uh, it is the hope that it will inspire other scientists to realize they can write, they have something to say, and they can push back. Science must come together and push back relentlessly. And let's not forget that we must make our voices heard because the next election is so critical for virology, indeed for all of science. And uh, in this particular case, I think we can elaborate and say Jim is an emeritus professor of cancer biology 
uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, visiting professor of immunology at the University of Arizona. I think he's hanging out in uh, Tucson. And in fact, he is the father of northern blots. Mm -hmm. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Uh, So I I haven't looked at this uh, op-ed, but I will. So I I, I did look at at the... Oh, I haven't looked at the op-ed, but I have looked at the uh, the original article in Journal mm-hmm. of Virology, and the editorial, or I, I guess, it, I think his original title for the LA Times is a sort of a business writer. Michael Hiltzik did write about this, and he cited the Journal of Virology paper. So it, that might be why LA Times has not accepted their op-ed, but it's he's, I think, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and... Um, He's got a nice article that a friend from Los Angeles sent me this morning. So uh, it has gotten at least some exposure in the mainstream media, but not as much as we would like. Alan. Sure. Mike writes, in TWIV 1136 letters, Will suggests that you continue to emphasize that the efficacy of the COVID vaccines are for prevention of severe disease, not infection. Many of us argued with friends and relatives during the pandemic to follow and support the science. Many of our arguments on public policy were based on the belief that we could eradicate the disease. Some diseases can be eradicated or eliminated, but not SARS-CoV-2. Realization of that fact came later for me after I was vaccinated and boosted. This was well after I had vehemently argued in favor of vaccination as a way to get beyond the pandemic. Vaccination does not eliminate this pandemic, so the argument for vaccinations is now not as strong as it once was. If you eventually correct your thinking, should you really get beat up for ever thinking otherwise? That's the whole purpose of educating the public. Eventually, you'll hear the facts, and that is the test. Are you one to ignore reality, or are you one to adjust your worldview to fit the emerging facts? That's what TWIV is for, giving people the opportunity to update their thinking. I am disappointed that we cannot eliminate or eradicate SARS-CoV-2, but I could say the same about HIV, influenza, and common cold coronaviruses. Research and study of these fields may make it possible to eliminate these diseases. It just takes time. The following paper on the CDC website explains a lot about how to categorize diseases and what is possible. It is entitled The Principles of Disease Elimination and Eradication. Provides a link. I appreciate TWIV's help recalibrating my thinking process, but it does make one grumpy to grapple with these uncooperative facts. Mike is in Lee's Summit, Missouri. Thank you, Mike. I would say Mike gets it too. Yes. Okay. One of the most important things going on here is that you don't necessarily get it right the first time, especially when you're dealing with something that's brand new and you don't know Uh, quite what's going on, you do the best you can and you learn in the process and you may have to correct some mistakes and that's okay. That's the way it ought to be done. People ought to be say, ought to be able to say, oh, I was wrong. Okay. And the new data leads me to this new conclusion. I would argue with his statement that vaccination does not eliminate this pandemic. You know, when a pandemic is an emergency situation, and eventually you don't have a pandemic. And I think there are many factors that go to that, but vaccines are one of them, right? You can now turn a disease for that's lethal into not as lethal, right? So Right. I think the meaning is it doesn't eliminate the virus. Yeah. Which okay. going with. We were pretty upfront about that, but maybe could have emphasized it more. And I think a lot of the public health authorities were not yeah. as yeah. clear about what the vaccine could and couldn't do. Um, and yeah, now we have an endemic virus. The We are past the point where the pandemic is an emergency because the vaccine allowed a lot of people to survive, to get to the endemic phase. Um, and now here we are. But yeah, we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to eradicate this virus like smallpox. So what, one, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, what I was just going to say was that uh, if you had a vaccine that did eliminate a SARS-CoV-2 from the human population, uh, it could still reappear, obviously, because there are other animal reservoirs yes. for this that could bring it right back. So, uh, you're, you're the Red Queen. Is that uh, what? That was uh, yes. that was <laughs> one of the things that facilitated the eradication of smallpox. Humans were the yeah. only host. And no reservoir. That's right. That's right. 
uh, Katya writes, Kristen, Christian Drosten has written a book about science, media, and politics. And uh, Katya sent the German abstract, so I translated it. Um, have we really survived the pandemic? The virologist Christian Drosten and best-selling author George Moskola are guests at Heimspiel today to talk to Wolfgang about the COVID-19 pandemic, which has already moved far into the past in many people's minds. A look back is more important than ever after all the role of politics, science, and social media in dealing with the global health crisis and an affected and divided society was serious. What was important and right? What now needs to be examined critically? What lessons do we need to learn from the last four years to prevent and be prepared for similar disasters in the future? Uh, in her book, Everything Overcome, an overdue conversation about a pandemic that will not be the last, which was published by Ustin Verlag at the end of June, Christian Drosten and George Moscolo dared to calmly and intelligently come to terms with the events and discuss the most important findings from their joint work in this episode. So did he write a book? She said he wrote a book about science, media, and politics, but it sounds like someone else did. I don't know. I have to look into it. Because if he did, I'd like to read it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Let me take this first link and see what... That's all in German. Translate it, please. <laughs> please yes, please translate it. Uh, nope, it's an advertisement. Anyway, so if he's written a book, thank you for pointing that out. If not, and twiv email. I was, I was thinking a couple of emails back, or the one before this one. I was reminded of very early on, when uh, we had Ralph Barrick on, and he postulated basically that he said the problem here is not necessarily that this is a super nasty virus, but it right. is a virus uh, with which we are unfamiliar, in particular the adult population, and that over time what's going to happen is we'll get population mm. immunity and it will become the fifth common cold coronavirus. And he yeah. was dead on. And I believe it was Ralph Barrick who also first broached the idea of spillbacks of this yeah. virus. Yeah. Which was also dead on. All right, let's do some picks, Dixon. What do you have for us? We all have another space um, bon mot, as it were. Um, this is from the, um, the Re Mars Reconnaissance uh, Satellite, which is uh, remarkable optical device that has been photographing Mars now for some, I think, 12 or so odd years and has made some amazing discoveries. What it has done is it accumulated enough pictures of enough landscapes for them over time to realize that water on the surface of Mars is still playing a role in reshaping the landscape. And you can see these trails, if you go to the um, the uh, website for the uh, uh, the orbiter with and watch and see all their uh, amazing almost looks three dimensional the way they they photograph you can see trails of uh, water um, sort of canals that they dug out of craters and stuff like this and all of the evidence put together says that there's water liquid water on the surface of mars as we now exist today but the big finding is that where did Mars at one point had oceans of water? And where did all that water go? Mm. And so they have found out. I, I don't have a good website quote for that because I wanted NASA to, to say something, but it was it wasn't said the way they said it in the common news articles. But Mars has a number of earthquakes that occur just like Earth has, and um, it sends sound waves and shock waves through the entire planet. And you can watch it deform according to its structure. And the deformation pattern clearly indicates that underneath the mantle of Mars, there is a lot of water. Maybe all of the ocean water that used to be on the surface has percolated down into the hard bedrock of Mars. So if you had a big straw that was about <laughs> I don't know how many miles you need, but I think it's like 20 or 30 miles below the surface. You could suck up all that fresh water that's down there now, but uh, that's not a good reason for going to Mars, just because you know there's a lot of water on the planet. Uh, it's inaccessible. Um, the most you can do is uh, take the water that's on the surface and 
use it again and again. But uh, anyway, I thought it was interesting. It, Very. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Enough said. <laughs> Kathy, what do you have for us? Well, I have something that came to me from a listener who sent me email. And uh, this listener is Ryan Asland, a molecular biology professor from Oslo, Norway. And he wrote the following to me. I'm a regular TWIV listener since January 2020 and enjoy your conversations a lot. Sometimes the urge to throw in a fact or a point in the discussion is strong. And so it was today when I listened to TWIV 1137 and the dengue story, where you mentioned that the Tata box binding protein, TBP, was used as a qPCR internal control, and, that's, and that that's news to you. In fact, it's quite old, at least from the early 90s. I picked it up at EMBL, which is a European molecular biology laboratory, where I did my postdoc. I and many others had realized then that the textbook control GAP-DH often varies a lot between cells and individuals and is not suitable. TBP, it turns out, is a good control for many situations. I see that even Kyogen has it in their list of endogenous references. And he provided the link. And so that's my pick is this link from Kyogen to a list of how housekeeping genes controls. <laughs> but I thought that was really interesting. So nice. there's GAP-DH. Yeah, there yep. it is, GAP-DH. <laughs> and, and we've known for a while that for some situations, actin is not a good control. And mm. some situations, like the one we heard about today, GAP-DH levels would not be a good control for baseline mm. housekeeping genes. Cool. That's for, I didn't know that either. That's great. Rich, what do you have for us? I have a pick for weather nerds, and I had uh, you in mind for this one, Alan. Okay. Uh, I mentioned before that we have a, uh, a local meteorologist uh, here in uh, Austin who's something of a celebrity, uh, Avery Tomasco, uh, who uh, has a Facebook page. And, uh, you know, Nowadays, rather than tracking the weather on various and sundry channels, when there's something interesting coming through, uh, we get on uh, Avery's uh, Facebook page and watch his updates because uh, it's all him, really, figuring this out, not some computer or, well, obviously there's computers in the background, okay? Um, and he's also very accessible. You can uh, write him on Facebook Messenger, et cetera. So I've been frustrated for literally decades by the fact that when I look at the weather page uh, on any newspaper, uh, in Buffalo is the Buffalo Evening News, in Gainesville it was the Gainesville Sun, here's the Austin Statesman, there'll be a one-page summary of the weather, and somewhere on that there'll be what is essentially an almanac that tells you what yesterday's weather was in terms of both temperature and uh, precipitation, and whether that's high or low, what the records are, blah, 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 and a bunch of uh, a bunch of other stuff. And as I cruise around the internet to try and find that kind of stuff online, in particular in a, a manipulable fashion, I couldn't, I, I have not been able to find it. So I complained to Avery, okay? And he wrote back and uh, tuned me <laughs> into this thing that I can't pronounce. I don't think it is pronounceable. XMACIS2, okay? Which when I dug into that a little bit, now I don't understand this, uh, it's defined as, a, it's a, an, an app basically uh, that compares the data in the Applied Climate Information System, ACES database, to that in the GHCN Daily, Global Historical Climatology Network Daily, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> So, and I looked at each of those individually because sometimes I found when I dig into stuff that some of the uh, underlying sources are actually better to use than uh, the uh, thing on top. But in this particular case, I couldn't make heads or tails of those, and I don't know what they're doing. Okay, but I have been able to, this is clunky, okay, you got to be patient, but I can poke around in this. And so, for example, uh, if you go into this and select Almanac for a day under single, under the single station menu, and then search for any zip code, yours for example, uh, uh, to uh, get a station, and then click go, you get exactly the kind of almanac data I'm talking about, okay? Yes. And then if you go to all sorts of different subroutines and start poking around, you find that there is a wonderful, 
resource of historical weather data in this that you can narrow down to a single weather station anywhere in the country. Okay, When I do Austin, you get the Austin map, and there must be, I don't know, 50 weather stations there, but I you know, poked around until I got to the official weather station of Camp Mayberry. It will say hot. Okay. Uh, yeah, it will say hot. <laughs> and I poked around with different things. So for you weather nerds out there, this is something to play with. This neat. is neat. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, it, and, it plays a huge you, role. In, it plays yeah. a huge role in ecology uh, for predicting um, patterns that mm-hmm. are disturbed by uh, climate change. Sure, yep. absolutely essential. Yeah, and- I wasn't able to make this work at first, but that's because I put the zip code in with the wrong tab selected. Yeah, you. Uh, you and, it and, is complex, and all yes. I could see was. <laughs> Things are in the Baltimore area, yeah, up to and including reason. Charlottesville. That's that's but, but why I, I put in. It, yeah. That's why I put into the show notes that specific example. Because if you run through that specific example, you get a bit of an idea how it works, right? And then you can start playing with the different menus and stuff. So yeah. I'm just going to say those again for the listeners. You go to the site and then you do single station almanac for a day, and then you do the station selection using the search tab. And put in your zip code yeah. and click go. Right. Yeah. Mm. That'll get you started. Yeah. <laughs> Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, a story, a news story from science um, about the world's most highly cited cat, Larry. Larry's H index would be the envy of many researchers. Uh, And the article leads off with a picture of Larry, so you can see what he looks like. Um, So Larry Richardson uh, was, uh, looked like he was a a mathematician with a tremendous career ahead of him, popped up all of a sudden in uh, Google Scholar and, um, you know, had an impressive age index right off the bat. And it turns out this was all um, a hoax. Of course, because Larry is not, in fact, a published mathematician, not having opposable thumbs, probably wouldn't even count in base 10. Um, (laughs) And uh, actually, no, I guess cats do have five toes on each. Yeah, they could count in base 10. And he could probably, uh, you know, my cat can do inputs from a keyboard. They don't make a lot of sense. But um, But he did go his way to the top. (laughs) um, This this involves a couple of researchers um, who... uh, who saw a Facebook ad to um, for a service to boost your citation index. Hmm. And these are <laughs> apparently, I haven't been on Facebook in years, but apparently these are common online that they these pop up there. Uh, but this particular one actually showed a picture of Google Scholar and a ranking, and the guy was able to reverse engineer how this was being done. Hmm. And it turns out the way it works is you... Um, you publish paper, papers to ResearchGate, which anybody can put anything on. It's just a repository. It's not really a journal. But if you put a bunch of papers on ResearchGate and you have those papers cite other papers that you put on ResearchGate, then you can accumulate citations. And since mm-hmm. your papers have, have cited other, you know, since your papers have accumulated citations, um, they must be relevant. And so your H index goes up and up. And so he generated a computer script that generated nonsense text and put it in a dozen publications on ResearchGate, all of which cited each other for 144 combined citations. Um, and this uh, this led Larry to be the most cited cat. Uh, <laughs> there was another cat earlier that somebody had put on, on an actual paper so that they would be able to say, we instead of I, it was a single author paper. So he put his cat on the paper so he could say, you know, we then determined this and it would make sense. There would be more than one author. Um, but in this case, um, it, uh, you know, it was for the purpose of illustrating just how ridiculous these attempts to measure mm-hmm. scientific output are. Um, and uh, Google Scholar apparently has now removed Larry's citations. I guess they caught wind of what was going on and... Uh, Larry is no longer highly cited, but uh, it's, I, I think to me, this just drove home something that I've thought about and talked about and written about over the years that this whole 
effort that's going on, this gamification of citations uh, that has become standard in academia in, in the past uh, couple of decades um, leads to these kinds of outcomes. And of course, people are exploiting it because that's the game. You know, don't hate the players. So we need to stop relying on numbers to try and quantify people's research output. I have to say that uh, Larry is a handsome-looking mackerel tabby. Larry is a very good-looking cat. Yeah, he's yes. a very good-looking cat. And I, you know, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if he didn't know all the math that he was cited <laughs> he for. He probably you know? <laughs> he's, you know, he's not he's not saying, okay, right. but he knows it all. Well, nobody yes. asked him for God's yeah. sake. <laughs> all right. My pick is an article from Quanta magazine. So open access, and it's called The Viral Paleontologist Who Unearths Pathogens Deep Histories. So Sebastian Calvignac Spencer looks in museums for viruses, genomes of viruses. And um, I, I didn't know this, and it turned out he has published a... Um, Measles genome from 1912, and another uh, Spanish influenza from 1918 from a 17 year old girl, and uh, he gets uh, specimens from museums and uh, tries to recover sequences from them. And this is an interview with him that talks about, you know, what he does and how he interprets it, and. Um, they ask him, you aren't worried about catching a virus from your samples? And he said, no, everything is dead. Everything has been disrupted by formalin. It's a nice picture here of a um, archive of, it's a pathology archive of respiratory tract specimens at the Berlin Museum of Medical History. You can see lungs preserved in formalin. So he goes in there and takes bits out and gets sequences. Neat. It's, it's cool. Very cool. I didn't realize that was uh, the old measles. I didn't realize 1912. That's pretty neat. That uh, that uh, museum <laughs> reminds me of a place that I feel yes. like you and I have been to. We I, went in Galveston. There's a pathology museum. Okay. With It looks just the same with yeah. jars on shelves, except it's in disarray. They're trying to fix it up, if right. you remember. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was it. But it's more than respiratory. The one in Galveston, which is, someone should mine it because, I mean, they had, I mean, all kinds of organs and stuff if you remember it's a little bit gruesome <laughs> but um yeah it's the same thing well i think that this is very cool i've been yeah. familiar with some of this kind of stuff because this sort of stuff is used uh to try and figure out the sort of the history of the smallpox vaccine which is something that uh we need to do sometime when i can get my act together and we also saw really good examples of this for the Evolution of the retrovirus that's uh, messing with koalas, right? Mm -hmm. Saw that yes. at the conference. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And they got some museum sequences. This is important stuff and really interesting. Yeah, museum have great collections, so you should mine it. And, yep. and it's remarkable what people can do now, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, uh, when you think about the early days, trying to get ancient DNA and stuff, a lot of people are doing this, and methods are uh, methods are pretty well worked out, boy. I wouldn't want to mess with it. The potential for, you know, trying to keep things clean must be really tough. Yeah. Yeah, they show um, the other pictures in the article. Uh, he's wearing a lot of PPE, to, you know, mask and gown, and he's all gloved up. And that's not to protect him from the viruses. That's to protect the samples from him. Yep. Exactly right. You know, just a... Uh, uh, a flaky epithelial cell off your forehead could wreck your day. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We have a couple of listener picks. Ryan gives us some links to uh, the news that WHO is declaring um, the public health emergency, the MPOX. Rona, as a listener pick, is this week's Radiolab episode. A fire ecologist... And an infectious disease doctor discussed how the wildfires clogged up hospital filters and led to a bacterial and fungus outbreak in a hospital. Huh. Wow. That's amazing. The microbes thrive in wildfire smoke. 
You might be interested in the guest, the MD, MPH, infectious disease doctor is Naomi Hauser. The fire scientist is Leah Kobziar, PhD. Very cool episode and cool individuals. Neat. And finally, David Renata, who is our video editor. This may not be suitable, being very political, but it would be great if it can be mentioned. Inspired by the Harris Waltz campaign and backed by my training in classical music, I decided to edit campaign event footage using the Ode to Joy from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Symphony as the music to fit within YouTube's 60 second time limit for a short. The music is greatly abbreviated, but I think the final cut is still effective. If you like it, share it around. It would be great if it would go viral. <laughs> Provides YouTube and TikTok links. Cool. Nice. Yes. So we will permit David uh, to do this because David works very hard to edit TWIV every week. That is TWIV1143. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Send your questions, comments, your picks of the week to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, we would love to have your financial support. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at trickinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. And uh, should I say it's a pleasure as usual? It always is. It always is. Dixon, the, the, the Living River has a lot of photographs. It does. Do you take any more photographs these days? Um. Some. Some. Yeah, some. Probably of your grandson. I'll, I'll send it, you a right? couple. <laughs> you, <laughs> don't go to, you don't go to Africa anymore. No, but we are planning a trip to, to Egypt, so uh, we shall have a lot of interesting pictures when I get back. Oh, well, so you were in Iceland. Yeah. You must have taken pictures in Iceland, right? I, well, it was in the wintertime, though, and it was not commended. It was windy and cold and rainy and was not good conditions at all, but we did get to see the northern lights. And had some very good fish meals in Reykjavik. If you've never been there, I, I highly recommend it. Just for the um, the Icelandic cod, it's 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 as fresh as it could ever get. I guess it would be. Yeah. Kathy Spindler is professor emerita at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com, turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.